I'm your host, Gray Waste Tim, and you are in the Den of the Gray Waste. Today, we're continuing on with the Zothic Legend Cycle by Lynn Carter. Our next tale is The Thing in the Pit, first published in Lynn Carter's collection Lost Worlds in 1980. The Thing in the Pit serves as a companion piece to Out of the Eons, a short story ghost written by H.P. Lovecraft for Hazel Heald and first published in 1935. It uses elements and mentions characters from that story, though they can be read in either order. You can find a link to a reading of Out of the Eons by Horror Babble in the video info. I highly recommend their channel for Lovecraft and other horror stories. The mythological narrative which follows is taken from the disturbing and debatable translation made by Professor Copeland three years after his return from Central Asia. His brochure, The Xanthu Tablets, a conjectural translation, was published at his own expense after being rejected by the academic firms which had printed his earlier, more scholarly works. Widely condemned as unsubstantiated ravings by his scientific colleagues, the brochure was swiftly suppressed by the authorities. The present editors make no claims for the validity of Copeland's translation. It must be remembered that the professor returned from Asia, his health, both mental and physical, broken by the terrible privations he endured in 1913, and that he died raving in an asylum only ten years after seeing his translation through press. His final manuscript, The Civilization of Mu, a reconstruction in light of recent discoveries, with its synoptic comparison to the Ryla text and the Ponape scripture, remains to this day unpublished and unpublishable. We have prefaced this extract from the Xanthu tablets with a note from Copeland's own introduction, from the preface to the translation. Upon prolonged study, I became firmly convinced that my initial impressions were thoroughly accurate and that the tablets were indeed inscribed in an elder Hariatic variant of the primal Nikal language. It is regretful that, with the death of poor, much maligned churchward, the last man who could have possibly attempted a decent translation of so obscure a variant was lost to the scientific community. Hoping that a chance existed that the colonel had left a key or some manner of Nikal glossary among his papers, I hastened to contact his estate and, with time and great cooperation which I am pleased to acknowledge here, a clue to the inscriptions was indeed unearthed in his files. What follows, however, is correctly termed a conjectural translation, and to this qualification I should perhaps add fragmentary as well. For although the inscriptions are complete, my respect for the public sanity is such that I would not care to subject wholesome, healthy minds to the full depravity, the hideous blasphemies, set down by the hand of the long-dead, accursed wizard priest of the abomination Yathagtha, whose tomb I opened, perhaps unwisely, in 1913. Let it be said now and in this place, once and for all, that the matter which I have named the Zothic Legend Cycle, which is to say the myth-sequence of the Zothic Triad, Gatnothwa, Yathogtha, and Zothamog, has at its secret core a chaotic and cosmic blasphemy, so appalling in its ultimate depravity, and in the magnitude of its bearings upon human and pre-human evolution, as to stun even the detached and dispassionate scholar. From the Xanthu Tablets, Tablet 9, Side 2, Lines 30 through 174. Part 1. The innumerable antiquities of Yathabob, Hierophant of Gotnothwa, the monster on the mount. I, Xanthu, wizard and last surviving priest of Yathogtha, the abomination in the abyss, have endured for long with uncomplaining and stoical fortitude. But this last supreme and ultimate affront I could not let pass in silence nor could I forbear from the action I will describe. For uncountable millennia, the fortunes of my cult had languished and waned, even as, during the same intervals of time, the rise to affluence and popularity of the rival cults, which celebrate the vile monstrosity that dwelleth ever atop the mysterious and untrodden heights of Yadat Go, had enjoyed an unbroken succession of triumphs. It was now, many millennia since that legended year of the Red Moon, when the rash and impudent Tyog, High Priest of the Old Ones, and votary of Shah Niggaroth, 
the mighty mother, sought with ultimate futility to whelm and break asunder for all time to come the power of God Nathla. In which vain and perilous attempt the unfortunate Tyog came to so unthinkable and shuddersome an end that even that dread chronicle, the Gore Negral, did not dare whisper a single hint or slightest rumor of his fate. It can easily be seen that the disastrous failure of the gallant, if incautious, Tyog was sufficient to overawe any other from making a similar attempt in all the ages since the year of the Red Moon to my own epic. For during the cycles which have lapsed from the era of Tyog to this day, none other has tried, and the rise to power and unquestioned authority of the cult of Gotnothwa has been loathsomely smooth and rapid. That this was, in very large part, the doing of Imash Mo can easily be demonstrated, for upon the horrible demise of the unfortunate Tyog, globally and hastily seizing upon the moment, the infamous Imash Mo, who is High Priest of Gan Nathwa in his day, proclaimed to all the Nine Kingdoms that his loathsome and noxious divinity was thus proven supreme over all the thousand gods of primordial and everlasting Mu. And alas, Imash Mo had long since gained ascendancy over the weak and easily swayed Thabo, King of the Province of Na, wherein rose the demon-possessed mountain of Yadit Go and King Thabo hastened to ratify the supremacy of Gotanothwa, even over the might of Cthulhu, the Lord of Rylaw himself. Lustrum by lustrum, cycle by cycle, the wealth, power, and following of the cold of Yathogtha declined thereafter. Even as did all the other of the thousand cults of Primal Mu, in vain did my priestly predecessors warn that the vengeance of the affronted gods would someday smite the Nine Kingdoms of Mu, and mayhap trample all the mighty continent beneath the green and seething waves of ocean, as ancient prophecies reiterated was to be our eventual and transcendent doom. But naught could avert or even retard the remorseless decline of the warship of Yathogtha. Translator's Notes Year of the Red Moon Friedrich Wilhelm von Junz, in his impressively researched Unesprechlichen Kulten, identifies this date as 173,148 BC. Part 2 When I, in my turn, assume the scarlet pontificals and the brazen rod of my office, in the year of the Whispering Shadow, I swore by the grey ritual of Kif, by the Vorak sign, by the weedy monolith, and by the might and glory of potent and terrible Yathogtha, that my god should achieve his triumph and his revenge during my pontificate. Alas, I had reckoned without the cunning and the ambition of Yathabab, for no sooner had the brazen rod been set into my grasp, and the thirty-one secret rituals of Yi been given over to my keeping, than the villainous high priest of Gotanothwa, let pass the ultimate and unforgivable affront against the dignity of my office and the splendor of my god. For this Yathabab had at length prevailed upon the palsied and enfeebled Shemag, monarch over Na, and a writ was proclaimed, which set under ban and interdict any other form of worship of the Great Old Ones than that approved by the followers of Gatanothla. The copper gates of the temple of Shabnigaroth were sealed, the greenly lit Adida of Cthulhu were deserted, and temple by temple, across the breadth of the Nine Kingdoms, the supreme power of Gotanothwa, the monster on the mount, was proclaimed. Now King Shamog was regnant over the province of Na, while I and my few acolytes dwelt in the land of Thu to the north, beyond the river of worms and the carven basalt cliffs and the catacombs of Thule. But great had the authority of Na grown in the eleven thousand years since the reign of King Thabo, and the hierophancy of Imash Mo. And in these moonlit latter days, the power of my land of Thu was shrunken, and seldom did mine own monarch, the degenerate Nagog Ying, dare oppose the will or whim of the King of Na. Thus it seemed inevitable that the last vestige of reverence for the abomination in the abyss should gutter and die, and in the very pontificate of one who had sworn by dread and terrible oaths 
to restore him to the heights of his former and tremendous might. Translator notes, Year of the Whispering Shadow. Evidence in the Ponapi scripture suggests this date may be equivalent to roughly 161,844 BC. Von Yunz does not include any reference to this period, as his commentary breaks off several millennia earlier. Part 3 In despair, I withdrew to the crumbling ruins of my palace, which stood of old upon the very brink of that profound and shadowed chasm, the Abyss of Yi, wherein the victorious Elder Gods had hurled the great Yathogtha, and had sealed him therein forever, under the potency of the Elder's sign and wherein to this day unbreakable bonds of psychic force imprison him, even as foul gotten Othwa is pent and imprisoned in that immemorable and cyclopean citadel atop Mount Yadgo, and great Cthulhu slumbers in his sunken city on the ocean-whelmed and eon-lost Black Island, and terrible Zoth Amog lies chained amid the deep beyond the isle of the sacred stone cities. Even in the uttermost nadir of my despair, it were unwise for me to neglect the awful duties of my sacerdotal office, and thus I turned from a dreary contemplation of this most dire of all the thousand inequities of the infamous Yathabab to that scrutiny and study of the thirty-one rituals demanded of my office. This precious document, of which the earth affords no single other copy, and which dates from the most extreme and legend antiquity, was indicted by the very hand of Nigam Zog, the first prophet himself in the dim eons before the old ones had yet dreamt of creating man. The secret rituals themselves were inscribed in fiery and metallic inks upon leaves of parchment fashioned from photogen membrane and bound between twin and carven and gem studded plates of unthinkably rare and precious loft metal brought hither from Dark Yagoth where it rolls upon the rim in the most remote of terrestrial eons by the shadowy Elder Ones. My seething brain, a roiling chaos of incoherent images, I perused one by one the thirty-one secret rituals of Yi, and in the last, most potent and terrific of them all, I found the answer to my dilemma. For that thirty-first ritual contained the dread and portentous formula which is called the key that openeth the door to ye, and which the primal and elder prophet warns is not to be spoken aloud, save in the final extremity of ultimate doom. Therein, in my madness and desperation, I found the answer for which I sought. I, Naga Sathogan Rala, Ea Yithogtha, a million generations yet unborn shall curse my name. Translator notes, Isle of the Sacred Stone Cities. The cryptic and horrible Ponapi scriptures says that Gatnathwa, Ithogtha, and Zothamog are sons of the mighty Cthulhu, lord of the watery abyss, and dread and awful potentate of drowned Ryla. While neither the scripture nor any other text of elder lore known to me records the planet wherefrom Cthulhu descended to this world, the scripture says of the origin of his three sons, the spawn of Cthulhu came down from remote and ultra telleric Zoth, the dim green double sun that glitters like a demonic eye in the blacknesses beyond Abbath, to whelm and reign over the steaming fens and bubbling slime pits of the mist veiled dawn eons of this earth. And it was in primordial and shadowy mood that they were great. Von Yuntz cannot identify Zoth, save to say that it lies in the same star cluster as Zalf, Abbath, and Imar. The reference to the Isle of the Sacred Stone Cities and the deep that lies off its shores, together with geographical data hinted at earlier in the Xanthu tablets, enables me to identify tentatively the place whereat Zothamog, the dweller in the deep, lies imprisoned as a submarine chasm off Ponapi. Translator notes The 31 Rituals. The Hierophant Xanthu is an error, for the surviving fragments of the Susran myth cycle. List a copy of the Yi rituals from Elder Mu, as among the necromantic tomes in the library of the great magician, Molly Gross. According to the inventory recorded by the sorcerer Negron, an incredibly ancient copy of the rituals was in the possession of the Saracen wizard Yachtub. 
According to the Irem chapter of the Necronomicon, Yaktub was the mentor to the mad heir of Abdul al-Hazrid. Another copy, perhaps the same Yaktubic redaction, is rumored to have been found in a sealed tomb in Egypt about 1903. Part 4 And thus was I resolved to open the door to ye, by which term is meant to render null the scriptures of the Elder Sign, and to release the Primal One, the Abomination in the Abyss, from the chains of psychic force which have imprisoned him in the depths of the Great Chasm for innumerable eons. To set free Yathogtha from his abyss would be at a single stroke to render him the most awesomely powerful of all the thousand gods of antique Mu, and to thus elevate myself as his Hierophant and Prophet, as the supreme and most potent priest in all of the Nine Kingdoms. The ambitions of Yathabab would thus be ground into the dust before my feet. The too easily dominated King Shemag would in a breath be divested of all authority, to the elevation of mine own monarch, Nagag Ying. The wealth and might of the province of Na would drain away like shallow mud before the sucking tides, and my own realm of Thu would achieve ultimate prominence over the kingdoms of Mu. What man dares condemn me, if in the last extremity of my need, I dared set my hand against the tremendous decree of the Elder Gods themselves. Thus, I went down the hidden stair to the ultimate and most secret crypt, burrowed deep into the bowels of the planet beneath the age-crumbling foundations of my palace, and there I caused my mute Ramal slaves to open the ponderous trap door, one single massy slab of hone and polished onyx revealing a black depth from which blew over a chill and noxious wind. And stealing my soul, I called upon the power of the Zothic Key, and summoned slithering from his black and noisome burrows the father of worms himself, even undying a putrescent Ub, leader and progenitor of the dreaded Yugya, the loathly and prehuman servitors of my god, who squirm and slither in the slime about his feet. Like a great glistening mass of putrid whitish jelly was Father Ub, and his squat and quivering trunk supported naught but a swollen and rounded head, wherein drooled and quivered ever a pink-rimmed obscene orifice, lined with triple rows of adamantine fangs. Now the Yugya serve my lord Yathogtha and his brother Zothamog. As the Deep One served Cthulhu, and the Chow Chows their lords, Zar and Loiger. As the Flame Creatures strive ever to free Cthulhu, and the Serpent Men of Elusia seek to unchain their lord, Yig. So do the Yugya tirelessly gnaw at the bonds that hold Yathogtha and Zothamog. Emerging at length, pale and shaken from my converse with Father Ub, whose unholy vileness and stench is even that of Aboth itself. I gained the upper air with relief, but I had won the aid of the burrowers beneath to my great endeavor, and together we swore to open the door to ye, though we incur the wrath of the Elder Gods upon remote and rubescent Glyavo. I chose the day of the writhing of the Aurora as most efficacious for my terrific endeavor, and thence to the brink of the mighty abyss of ye went I forth, with my few frightened acolytes in my train. And in the hour of the singing of the green vapor, I stood upon the cliffs overlooking the profound and gloom-veiled depths of the chasm, and made the scarlet sacrifice, while behind me arose the wailing chorus of my acolytes and the uncouth and alien rhythms of the Yugya chants. I performed the red absolution, I brandished the Zothic key, I traced upon the trembling air and characters of living and supernal fire the hieroglyphs of Ur. I performed the Quar exorcism. I called upon the doles and eon-forgotten Aklo. I employed the lore of the Forbidden Litany. I summoned the Zloth entities from beyond the extraspatial region of asymmetrical, etheric polarity. I adored the black flame in a manner which makes my soul shrink and shudder within me to this hour. I called upon all of the gods of Archaic Mu, 
upon the Great Ones, saving only the noxious and tyrannical Gatanathwa. And upon the Lesser Ones, upon Yig the Serpent Father, and Shadowy Nug, and Yeb of the Whispering Mist, upon Ayod the Shining Hunter, and Vorvidasa Belyonach, the Troubler of the Sands, and upon him who is to come, and upon Father Dagon and Mother Hydra, who rule the Deep Ones, who are his servants in the Green Sea. And I uttered in a great voice the name which is not ever to be uttered aloud. Above me, the stars trembled and burned pale, as waxen tapers in an icy and miasmic drought. All save for the scarlet burning eye of Goliavo, which blazed more brightly than before. Beneath my heel, the earth shook with tremors, and from the dimly lit west, where titanic mountains marched the breath of Mu, deep subterraneous thunders mumbled, and cold black craters burst redly into flame, filling angry heaven with seething smoke. My acolytes huddled before me, white faces hidden in shaken hands, and there was a great silence upon the earth for seven breaths of time. Translator's Notes Glyavo In an often quoted passage of the Necronomicon, al identifies the name, which is primal Nikal, as that of the star known to the Arabic astronomers of his day as Abit al Janza, which is to say, Beetlejuice. Part 5 And then my heart leapt up within me for hard and blasphemous joy, for lo, I had released the first of the seven bonds that had, from the immemorable depths of forgotten time, held prisoner the abomination in the abyss. And he lifted himself above the brink of the vast chasm of Yi, and gazed down upon his Ark Hierophant. Very terrible was Yathogtha to the sight of men, and more huge than my mind could scarcely accept. Like a black glistening moon, he rose above the brink, a gigantic hemisphere of quaking slime, vaster than any mountain. Faceless and neckless was he, save that from his front a terrific beak thrust forth. Cruel and terrible and curved was this beak of blackest adamant, and it measured many thousands of paces in its length. And then, half a league further along the brink of the chasm, a second hemispheric, black glistening beak head rose into sight, and another, and then yet a fourth mountainous and colossal beak head rose above the lip of the abyss. And then it was true terror smote me to the heart, for I saw and knew my lord in his awfulness, and we trembling mortals were dwarfed by him, like motes before the ponderous Yoketh lizard were we, and suddenly, horribly, I knew what I had done. The acolytes huddled at my feet knew in the same instant, and squealed shockingly, and wallowed in squalid and gutless terror, wriggling before the altar of the abomination. To flee, staggering and stumbling, white to the lips with wide mad staring eyes that burned with pale fire like sick moons. And I too, foiled to the depths of my being, turned on palsied and trembling limbs, hurling from me with sudden horror the loathsome volume of the rituals, which fell into the abyss from which ultimate and mind-blasting nightmare had but part way emerged. And I ran, ran, while the earth shook and great crevices opened to split the land asunder. Ran, while mountain after mountain erupted in flame and thunder, and the sea boiled madly and a great terrible shaft of unearthly light burned down the star gulfs from distant and blazing Glyavo. Ran, even as down that terrific star beam descended, from the remote star that flamed like a wrathful and revenging eye athwart the smoke-veiled and volcano-shaken west. Terrible great things like terrific towers of flame, which I knew to be either the Elder Gods or their servants while sky-tall and burning towers swept the abyss with their lightnings. And I fled through the gates of Yuhadoth, where dwelleth my king, but which lay now in smoking ruin, 
shaken by the great tremors of the earth, and I scourged the panic-stricken multitudes before me, who knew not the true nature of the monstrous and inconceivable thing I had almost freed, drove them shrieking into the Vidya Vahans, the ancient sky chariots of Elder and Doomfraught Mu, while the ground shook and the towers fell and mountain after mountain erupted in thunderous flames. And we fled through the storm-torn skies and across the wind-lashed waves, fled all that unending night of flame and doom and chaos while behind our skyborn keels a memorable and terror-haunted moot crumbled under the mighty waves that beat in from the angry sea, broke apart, shaken to its unstable core by the convulsions of outraged nature, lashed by starry fires of the Elder Gods. On we flew at length into a distant land near the hidden gates of Elder Shambhala itself, but mere distance cannot erase from my terror-frozen brain the ultimate glimpse of nethermost hell that shook my soul when I saw and knew that vast, beaked, and mountainous head of the thing in the pit, that awful and eon-accursed thing whose unthinkably prodigious fingertips I had seen. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that story. I plan to cover the rest of the Zothic legend cycle, as well as some other weird tales in future read-alouds. If you're interested in those, or if you'd like to see my scripted content and catch my live streams, then like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. All the YouTube things that help the channel grow. I'll be back in the future with more weird tales. Until then, support your local library.